Alors, merci à tous. Euh, merci à l'équipe de Sylvie et Sandrine pour l'invitation. Euh, bienvenue. Euh, je suis Canadien. Je peux parler français, mais notre langue de travail, c'est anglais. So I will switch into English. I apologize right now. I am the managing director of a National Center of Competence in Research. Um, the Swiss National Centers of Competence in Research are a program from the Swiss National Science Foundation to develop high-risk, high-return research for Switzerland. They are interdisciplinary, they are collaborative, and they are all based on topics of national interest. And the goal of these research groups is to develop innovations which can be then transferred on to industry. Currently, there are 21 uh, NCCRs across Switzerland, and they're in the topics that you expect. Particle physics and medicine and social sciences and all of the various degrees of, of science and research that we do in Switzerland. And we are very proud to have an NCCR on this topic of digital fabrication in architecture and construction. So, digital fabrication. Our approach to this is to combine these three areas. The first area is computation and process innovation. The second area is material sciences and constructive systems. And the third area is robotics, control, and fabrication. Uh, as mentioned, we are over 150 people. Our base is at ETH Zurich. Um, and we have a 12-year duration, and we are at the eight-year point right now. So we still have four more years of, of work to go. Of course, there are many experts who are involved in this. There are experts from architecture, civil engineering, mechanical engineering and robotics, but we also have specialists in the areas of mechatronics and, and material science and computer science. And it's this grand group that brings together knowledge that allows us to do some of the amazing things that, that are possible. But these are not the important people. The important people is the vast array of researchers that we have working for us, and the fact that we work at the doctoral level and the postdoctoral level, and that most of the people who are doing research for us have had experience in industry before they have gone back to do research. And of course, as a national, uh, as a national consortium, we, of course, are based at the, uh, on the top row. You can see the, the federal institutes, so ETH Zurich, EPF in Lausanne, and EMPA. But we also have regional partners, and the regional partners are very important because the universities of applied sciences tend to have much closer links with industry and are, tend to be much better at doing transfer into industry. Currently, we also have about 70 industry partners from various sectors who are working with us to get our innovations out. Now, why would the federal government, why would the Schweizer Nationalfonds, the, the Swiss National Science Foundation, why would they invest in digital fabrication? Well, the first is they want to ensure that Switzerland maintains its position as a leading nation in this area of architecture, engineering, and construction, in AEC. Secondly, they want to ensure that we focus on the sustainable triple bottom line, focusing on ecology or environmental issues, focusing on society, quality of life, but also increasingly these questions about labor in construction. And third is the question of economy and productivity and how that will play back to your, your businesses. But lastly, we want to improve the productivity and motivate the AEC sector to move forward. We're all very well aware that construction is a notoriously slow adopter of technology, and it's notoriously slow at making change. And we are trying to find ways to motivate it to move forward. One of the best examples is this. This is the productivity of Switzerland over 20 years from 95 to 2015. And the green line that you can see at the top is manufacturing goods. The pink line is construction. And we can see that construction improves a little bit and then maybe the regulations change or maybe the materials change or maybe there's a new technique that comes on the market and it has to adapt and then productivity goes down again. So I'm not saying that, in it, that construction is not an innovative sector but they respond to the forces that are put on them. And this is recognized also globally. So this is an article from 
The Economist from a couple of years ago, roughly the same graph in the small, but the, the highlighted bottom statement that no industry has done worse at adopting new technologies than, than architecture and construction. Now, what is driving this? Humans. According to the WEF, almost 95% of the Earth's surface has been modified by us. By our impact, we are upsetting the delicate ecosystems that sustain life on the planet. And the climate emergency that we are witnessing is not only caused by sustainable energy production or excessive agriculture, but almost 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions and waste come from construction and the operation of the built environment. To meet ever-growing global demand for more living and working infrastructure due to the increase in the world's population, we need to rethink how we build and we need to build smarter. We need to use less resources, we need to produce less waste, and we need to do this in construction. Now, the increasing number of construction projects combined with a significant shortage of skilled labor puts us into the position that we need to rethink the way we're doing construction. Now, we've all seen articles that look like this, that the robots are coming, and it instills maybe some, maybe even fear in people about technology and change. But I propose to you today that we need not fear it, that, we, that there are reasons to embrace it. The jobs will change. The technologies will change the way we do things, but the change will be good for the construction industry. And we are also used to seeing pictures like this. This, of course, is complete science fiction. And this is one of the problems that we face in research, is that the science fiction is so convincing now that people expect the technology to be immediate and easy, and it's really not. So in 2012, when we were developing the proposal for the funding of this NCCR, the Economist magazine's technology issue was on 3D printing. And how 3D printing, this is 10 years ago, 3D printing was going to change the world. Two years later, when we actually started the NCCR, the, econo the, the technology issue of The Economist was on the rise of the robots and how robots are coming out and coming into the world around us. And what happened in those two years? There are three main things that happened. First, the cost of computation went down dramatically. So computers became much cheaper, they become much more powerful, so the cost of computation went down. The second thing was that the availability of industrial robots and their price also became much more easy for smaller firms to afford. And the third thing that happened was that sensors became much smaller, became much easier to integrate, and therefore they could be integrated onto these robots. So no longer the robots were blind, they could see what they were doing. Now, the problem with sensors is that they produce a lot of data, but you still need a method to interpret that data. And that creates a huge com computation problem. But I started by saying that the cost of computation went down, and so it became much easier to integrate sensors, to process the data, to use the data, and to create a feedback loop so that the robots could function in a project and they could adapt to what they're building. Now, the other really interesting thing about these two slides is that they represent the two modes of construction. On one hand, you have prefabrication, building something in a controlled environment, in a controlled factory. And on the other hand, you have technology coming out into the real world, into the chaotic real world. And so this really sets the tone for the research that we do. We do bespoke digital prefabrication, building things in the lab or in the factory, and we have on-site digital fabrication, which is where we try to get the technology out into the chaotic environments of the construction site. So digital fabrication, both for prefabrication and on-site construction, is an interdisciplinary research field aimed at integrating automation and digitization into the fabrication of buildings. These advancements aim to impact all phases of a building's lifetime with immediate effect on design, fabrication, assembly, and maintenance. Through the use of robotic solutions, 
optimize structural form, material efficiency, and by switching to low carbon materials, we're able to save up to 70% of material while reducing the overall waste in construction processes. We are currently able to automate most simple forms of manual labor, and we're improving on using sensors and computer vision feedback to meet current construction tolerances and build quality. So I started off with this three-part diagram. We have computation, material systems, and robotic control. In computation, I think many architecture firms and engineering firms are at the point where they understand CAD and BIM. Many are now also using parametric design, but increasingly we are using computational design, where there are algorithms that help in the design to incorporate performative factors, to incorporate uh, feedback loops, and to improve overall efficiency in the designing process. We also have material science and constructive systems where we're introducing novel materials, where we are specializing existing materials, such as tuning concrete or changing alloys of steel or adjusting glass to be more structural. But then we also have new hybrid methods of assembling different materials and new constructive methods. And finally, in robotic control and fabrication, there's two main areas. There's the area of the robots themselves, and then there's the area of 3D printing. And it's important to say that both of them are about positioning some kind of tool in space. So a robot is only a method for putting the tool in the right place. And 3D printing is doing the same thing, but usually in a more contained way. So just to give you a, an idea of, of what's going on, here is a, a video of, of what we have accomplished in the last four years and kind of a pitch on what we are trying to accomplish for the next four. So I hope that gives you an idea of the state of the art. So these are things that we've now accomplished and that we are working on. But the one thing that I would point out in that video is that the challenges that we face are less about creating new technology. The challenges that we face are more about convincing people on how to use it and how to engage technology into their existing building models. So the challenges that we're facing right now Uh -huh. It's not here. The challenges that we're facing right now are disruptions to existing building models, education and training, and regulations, codes, and, and liability. And these are all people factors. These are not technology factors. So what is uh, really important for us is trying to get these things out into the real world so that we're able to engage with professionals and overcome many of these challenges together with the people who are implementing. I'm going to show you a couple of the projects that we do, and these are what, are, what we call demonstrators. These are full-scale projects with industry, and we use these projects together with partners from industry also as a, a training mechanism. We design real-world feasible projects to collaborate and share knowledge, to develop risk mitigation approaches, to test the performance criteria, and to try to improve the overall cost performance and reduce the impact of our project. So I'm going to show you quickly two projects. The first one is based at Nest, which is a, a kind of a test site in Empa in Dubendorf. The idea of Nest is to build a vertical village of a whole bunch of 
actual built modules. This is what the, the, the backbone of Nest looks like, and we built this project here called the Defab House. So the Defab House was our first project where we tried to combine a number of our innovation objects. And so we did projects in robotics, we did projects in concrete, we did projects in 3D printing. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is spatial timber assemblies, which is this structural frame which we assembled using robotics. The idea of the project was to develop this structural frame using all of the computational methods that we have and to have them be parametric and responsive to the needs, but also to use the direct digital model that was produced as the basis for fabrication. So no breaking into shop drawings and then into production assembly files and so on, but to really go directly from CAD model to the robot and allow the robot and the algorithms that we use to do the path planning on how these things come together. In research, things don't move fast because there's a lot of adjustment that happens, so you can count the number of nights that happen in these time lapses. But in all cases, the robots are doing the work of picking the beam, cutting the beam, correcting the angles, placing the beam, and then humans are actually putting the, the pieces together. It's also very important to note that we as a research institute cannot take responsibility for a, an inhabited building. So it's very important that our, our, our industry partners are part of this all the way through. And of course, we have members of our partner, in this case, Erna Age, uh, on site, monitoring what we're doing and, and helping us build this as, as it moves forward. In the end, you come up with a module that looks something like this. And this large construct is made up of many of these pieces. Each one is individual, each one is, is distinct. We ship them to site and assemble them on site. And in the end, you have this structure on the upper part of the house that is made in this way. Now, if anybody has questions about why we built it using these funny angles and so on, I think we can talk about that in the break. But what's really important is for you to see who was involved in the project, who was involved from, from industry, and how we were able to kind of bring them together to, to create this uh, unique showpiece. The second project I'd like to show you is this project called the Hilo. This is not a robotics project, but this is digital fabrication in a different way. And specifically, I want to talk about this roof. So this roof is a concrete roof, and it was made using uh, a tensile cable net structure which holds up the formwork. So in the end, the formwork is a reusable steel net that is combined with some plastic sheeting, and then we apply concrete directly onto that to minimize the overall waste. This is a, an example of the prototype that we built. The client, in this case EMPA, did not believe that we would be able to do this. So they they asked us to build a one-to-one -one scale prototype of the roof in our laboratory. And here you can see that we put together a frame, we built up this cable net. Each one of the nodes of the cable net has a small sensor on it that we're able to scan, and we're able to see the deflection, and we're able to tune the cable net. Then we lay uh, carbon fiber netting over the top, and we spray or we shot create the, the overall surface. And we need to know the deflection of the cable as we are putting the concrete on because the resultant weight achieves the maximum structural form. At its thinnest, this is 2 centimeters, and at its thickest, this is 15 centimeters. And the concrete changes from the type that's on the top, which is relatively thin, to the concrete which is applied at the bottom, which needs to be thicker so that it doesn't all run off. This is what the prototype looked like, but what's maybe more interesting is this image of when we were destroying the, the, the prototype. You can see the minimum amount of concrete lying on the ground. That gives you an idea of how absolute little concrete we were using for this project. Of course, then, we take it into the real world. We take it onto the construction site. We build up the frame again, we build up the fabric, we build up the, the formwork. This is the shell as it was cast on site. 
and this is the resulting building. The shell uses roughly 60% less concrete than if we had used traditional formwork because we are able to control the tolerances. We are able to control the thickness. And this is a fully insulated, fully functional building, including radiant heating within the roof. Now, the partners in this project, not only were they coordinating on the project, but we also used an internal software framework to coordinate all of the software, all of the data that was generated. This was all coordinated at a central point, and we used a, a program that we've developed in-house called Compass, but it's also open source. So you're welcome to go online and, and take a look at what Compass could possibly do for you. This is the, the resulting building. It's also at the EMPA campus, and it's, uh, it's open if anybody would like to visit it, go to and see our partners. So, our demonstrators, we demonstrate what is possible. We test the real world feasibility of this, but most importantly, we use the collaboration and we build partnerships with industry to bring people closer to being able to make the decisions of what digital fabrication means for them. Now, how do we take this forward? We validate our research for further development and commercialization. Right now, we have three spin-offs of our research. We have Mesh, which is doing robotic steel cage fabrication for complex forms for reinforced concrete. We have Seiki Robotics, which is doing flexible production of large-scale 3D printed parts, and they combine additive manufacturing and reductive manufacturing. And finally, we have a, a spin-off in the area of augmented reality and, and artificial intelligence for instructing people how to build things on site using handheld devices. So these spin-offs are, are a very important KPI for us as a research institution. When I started this presentation, I showed you these two slides, 3D printing and robotics. This was 2012 and 2014. Does anybody have an idea of what the technology issues were after this? Anyone want to guess? Any of my friends down here? So the next big topic, obviously, is artificial intelligence. So machine learning, but also artificial intelligence and the connection to, uh, to sensors. And the last project that I'd like to show is about how people are going to engage with technology in the future and our vision for how people will engage with robotics in construction. We, every year we have a, a researcher in residence who comes from away. Sometimes they are artists, sometimes they are people from industry, and sometimes they are people from, from other research institutions. This past year we had Madeleine Gagnon who came to us. She does installations using robotic equipment, and I'm going to show you a quick video on what she did with our facility. My name is Dr. Madeline Gannon, and uh, my friends invite me to misuse their tools. So I've been here at the, the ETH on invitation from the NCCR to come and use their robots to kind of push them to their absolute limit of what they can do. I tend to focus on how to make machines behave more like animals. When I think about these machines. I think about their superhuman speed and their superhuman strength and endurance and reliability and persistence. You know, all these adjectives that we describe are superheroes. They have superpowers and yet their usefulness is kind of locked away in this really hard to use software tools. And I want to be able to just engage with them in a way that's very natural, that, that you know, just how we harness the power of the horse or the ox, like, we can do that with machines too. It's been incredible to come and be amongst kind of the brightest minds in architectural robotics that are thinking about how these machines can construct new forms. Um, I guess I hope to bring in some more questions that, that think about how do these machines engage with people and work with people to do incredible things that are at the edges of our imagination. You know, my goal 
in research, my goal in life is to live in the future. And so I try to build these little vignettes that get you to fast forward to some of those futures. So with these machines, it's, it's like we're living 10, 15 years in the future where the robots are amongst us and we're not using them as tools, but we're coexisting with them in the same space. I mean, I'm taming them. So these guys have been really well behaved. Uh, I've been making some software that tries to breathe life into them and give them a little bit of a holiday from their normal lives. This is the fourth in the series that I've done in robot taming. And, and it might be my last because like, where am I going to get a better environment and setup and machines and equipment to do something on a grander scale. This has set a very high bar for, for me going forward. So I show this last piece to kind of give you an insight as to where we might go in the future. The, the relationship between people and technology does not necessarily need to be one of man and tool. We are getting to the point where we have our personal assistance in our pockets, where we have technology that engages with us in a more personal way than a tool does. And it's very important for us to understand that these technologies should also be seen as a partner in the process. They come with a different skill set, they come with different capabilities, but they allow us to do things in ways that might not be possible only by people, only by humans using traditional construction means. So in closing, I want to point out that a lot of industry see, a lot of industry think that this is digital fabrication, that Digital fabrication is machines and technology and the absence of people. But what I would propose to you today is that actually the future of construction and the future of digital fabrication is this. It requires experts from many different fields and it requires collaboration and it requires them all to come together with a common goal. And I would also propose to you that this is the basis of construction. This is how construction has operated for centuries. And if we allow ourselves to tune the way we are approaching the tools, the methods, the procedures, and the materials, then we will be able to engage better with digital construction for the future. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>